Hi guys, it is a chilly, cloudy Wednesday morning. We have made it to Wednesday, February 20th, 2013 here in the drought-plagued wasteland of South Austin, Texas, where we're just getting tortured with this little spattering of rain as it just heads off somewhere else. And so Wednesday morning, here on the, the, the only day in the entire month of February that even vaguely resembles a winter day, ironically enough. Of course, it'll be 80 degrees again tomorrow. Uh, for me to come out of here and do my, my normal weekly rant, which is the easiest day that I have to be a doomsday prophet, an environmental alarmist, and the chronicler of the downfall of global civilization, because this is the day that I go, that I do my climate meltdown, my climate change, global warming, meltdown, roundup, whatever I call this thing, every Wednesday morning, where I go on to the pages of the mainstream media, in this case, the Yahoo News science page section, the the environmental page of the Yahoo News science section, where I survey the mainstream media for articles to show that the climate on this planet is going, um, is turning this planet, you know, into a burning lake of fire. And uh, guys, I will I have to say that the, the seems like the biggest subject of discussion of uh, this week related to climate change is something that, that I personally am not so sure is that related to climate change or not as, it, it, not as related as people think it is, and that is the Keystone pipeline. Now, 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 make no mistake about it, guys. I am violently opposed to the Keystone Pipeline. Okay, I'm not, I'm not, don't, don't, anything, any opinions that, that come out of my mouth uh, about the Keystone Pipeline that sound like that, that I might be supporting this environmental boondoggle, I want to make it clear that uh, I'm just saying that the climate change angle of the of the Keystone Pipeline might be that there's other things every bit as bad or worse about it. But anyway, uh, let's see what the uh, mainstream media is saying about this. And so this is you know right off this first headline uh, by some woman named Susan Graybeal. This is right out of Yahoo itself. 40,000 people reported at climate change rally. So the, you know, the words Keystone Pipeline, what this is referring to is this huge turnout. I guess they're calling, I don't know where they, how they ever estimate these crowds, this article claiming that 40,000 people turning out up there in Washington, D.C. on Sunday to protest the Keystone Pipeline and, and it is now being called in the mainstream media instead of 40,000 people reported at Keystone Pipeline Rally, they, they, just, they just call it a climate change rally. Uh, Alright, so what is this saying? The environmental organization 350.org, great organization by the way, is reporting that more than 40,000 people attended the quote forward on climate rally in Washington to call for President Barack Obama to reject the Keystone XL pipeline. Okay, then it breaks down what was going uh, on. Uh, anyway, in addition to 350.org President Bill McKibben and I'm glad to see uh, Sierra Club Executive Director Michael Brune. Uh, speakers at the rally also. Anyway, it just goes through who all the who all the uh, speakers were, uh, and then uh, and then there I guess there was another big protest with hundreds of people over there in Los Angeles. Good for them. 
All right, but I want to just get down to the bottom of this, uh, which, which is the, which is the real news here. Uh, I, guys, instead of putting links to each one of these individual stories, what I always do is I just put the link to the environment page where you can find all of these stories and a lot more. But let me, I always like to just get down to the bottom of stories, which usually, uh, which frequently has more news in the top. Okay. Reuters reported that in spite of the numbers attending the Washington rally, a new poll by Harris Interactive showed that 69% of respondents are in favor of the Keystone Pipeline, while only 17% were opposed. Just days ago, a, a bipartisan group of U.S. Senators. Note that a bipartisan group, this is meaning Republicans and Democrats alike, of U.S. Senators called for Obama to approve the $5.3 billion oil pipeline, which would transport 830,000 barrels of oil per day from the Canadian tar sands to U.S. refineries, <clears throat> Reuters reported. There you go. So these are just two of the reasons, uh, these poll numbers and this bipartisan coalition of senators calling on uh, Obama to, uh, you know, to rubber stamp this. This is why I believe that Barack Obama will certainly, now that he is safely back in the White House for his second and last term, uh, that there's nothing going to stop him from approving the, uh, the Sierra Club, uh, the Sierra Club pipeline. I love it. Approving the Sierra Club pipeline. There you go, guys. Uh, but I guess that was not the only, I guess there were two rallies up there in front of the White House since I've been up on this rock. Uh, so I guess this was a rally going on on Thursday, February 14th. Uh, this is from Live Science Magazine. <clears throat> NASA climate scientist arrested in pipeline protest. About my, about my Humpty Dumpty tribe hero, James Hansen. Uh, okay. Climate scientist James Hansen was arrested Thursday outside the White House while protesting the proposed construction of the controversial Keystone XL pipeline. The 1,179-mile pipeline would carry heavy crude oil from Canada, specifically from uh, Hardisty, Alberta, to the U.S. Gulf Coast of Texas. But the project needs the president's approval for a construction permit. Okay. Some 48 environmental activists, including Hansen, and I, and I'm, and you know, hats off to you, the ex including Hansen, the executive director of the Sierra Club, Michael Brune, he was arrested. Uh... Bill McKibben, who was co-founder of the grassroots climate group 350.org, he was arrested. There's Daryl Hannah, Darryl Hannah and getting her rap sheet a little bit longer. Civil rights activist Julia Bond, Julian Bond. Uh, all practiced civil disobedience in front of the White House. Uh, demanding the president deny the pipeline construction and address the climate crisis. So it's, you know, so what happens to anybody in this country uh, from Daryl Hanna to NASA climatologist to the head of the Sierra Club who dares uh, exercise their First Amendment rights to protest this country in front of the home of the president of the uh, of this country will be arrested. Okay, 
Environmentalists argue that not only would the pipeline seal the country's dependence on dirty fuels, adding to the emissions of greenhouse gases and the warming of the planet, it would also disrupt various ecosystems as it slices through critical habitats, not to mention the habitat of the tar sands themselves where this nasty shit originates. Okay, this is my uh, uh, hero Hansen uh, argues that promoting both renewable energy and oil and gas production, you know, as I talked about Obama talking out of both sides of his mouth, uh, with projects such as Keystone is not feasible. Quote, we have reached a fork in the road, he told the Washington Post, and politicians have to understand we either go down this road of exploiting every fossil fuel we have, whether it's tar sands, tar shale, offshore drilling in the Arctic, and all these other things that Barack Obama is making part of his energy policy. Uh, but the science tells us we cannot do that without you know, creating a situation, you know, just uh, a, a, an environmentally untenable situation is what he's talking about. So that's uh, the pipeline would carry what environmental groups call one of the dirtiest types of oil, tar sands, which is a mix of clay, sand, water, and bitumen, which is a heavy black oil. Uh, and this is quoting uh, the, the Julian Bond, uh, who was also arrested, quote, the threat to our planet's climate is both grave and urgent. Although President Obama has declared his own determination to act, much that is within his power to accomplish remains undone and the decision to allow the construction of a pipeline to carry millions of barrels of the most polluting oil on earth from Canada's tar sands to the Gulf Coast in the U.S. is in his hands. I am proud today to stand before my fellow citizens and declare I am willing to go to jail to stop this wrong the environmental crisis we face today demands nothing less. Okay, so uh, what is the uh, pipeline's effect on climate change? All right, estimates by the Environmental Protection Agency suggest the Keystone Pipeline would increase the annual production of carbon emissions by up to 27.6 million metric tons, or the equivalent of nearly 6 million cars on the road. There you go. So that is what uh, the EPA is saying the carbon the carbon footprint of this one pipeline is equal to about six million cars. So it seems to me like maybe we should just get rid of six million cars. Better yet, let's get of about, rid of about uh, 50 million cars. Maybe we could, maybe as an effort to do that, we could raise the gasoline tax that Barack Obama could raise the gasoline tax to about $10 a gallon. So guys, this is, you know, I have to decide because this article uh, segues into two more. I'll take these one at a time. Uh, obviously, there, there is a different view from Bill McKibben's and James Hansen's and Julian Bond's view of this. So, uh, so let's listen to what the other side is saying uh, from Associated Press. Trans Canada 
pipeline would not affect climate. What a surprise. Uh, in a shift in strategy, the company that wants to build an oil pipeline from western Canada to Texas said Tuesday that the project will have no measurable effect on global warming. There you go. Alex Porterby, TransCanada's president for energy and oil pipelines, said opponents of the proposed Keystone XL pipeline have grossly inflated its likely impact on emissions of greenhouse gases that contribute to global warming. And uh, so he... Uh, here, here this guy, a simple math tells us that the oil sands represent only one-tenth of one percent of global greenhouse emissions. Even if production from the oil sands were to double, the greenhouse gas contribution from the oil sands would be immaterial to global greenhouse gas productions. Uh, there you go. This uh, he was just saying this yesterday, uh, at, at, in a response to you know what these people at the rally were saying. Uh, of course, Tuesday's forum was organized by the National Association of Manufacturers. Okay. Uh, Quote, our opponents are trying to make this debate about greenhouse gases. So uh, anyway, this goes on and on. Uh, you, you can read this. And guys, you, you know, this is what I'm talking about. We're, we're, we're on one level and don't, and, and, and don't read too much uh, uh, into this. Uh, on, on, on one level, I agree with this planet-eating pig, president of TransCanada, uh, that this pipeline, uh, you know, when you look at it from the world perspective, okay, this pipeline is negligible. Uh, these six million cars a, you know, is pretty negligible. And, and, and where are these six million cars being added to the global atmospheres over there in China? And guys, if this pipeline by some miracle is actually blocked by Barack Obama, uh, which of course I do hope it is, uh, guys, who are we kidding? They're just going to build the pipeline instead to the Pacific Ocean where all of these tankers from China will be quite happy to load up this shit, haul it off to China, and start burning it in their six million plus cars per year they are adding to the global total. This is a global issue. Okay, it makes, from a global perspective, from a global environmental issue, it makes virtually zero difference whether Barack Obama uh, okays this thing or not. The threat to the U.S. from this, the direct threats to the U.S. from this, are from the oil spills to all of these ecosystems, watersheds, rivers that this that this pipeline is going to cross but all of this stuff about the climate change you know this guy's right on uh, from a global perspective it really doesn't mean jack shit it, it's more uh, you know it, it's more of a PR thing that that if Barack Obama approves this like he is going to do what he is going to do is, is, is simply lose all credibility, all credibility, uh, with environmentalists who believe one word of the horse shit coming out of his mouth that he gives a shit about global warming. 
you know, don't get me going on this rant. So, uh, and which will lead me into my next article. This is uh, from ABC Otis News. I'm not sure what Otis News is, but it's coming out of o- the ABC News. Analysis. Choices loom for Obama on climate change. So what this is about, you know, going back to his sh- horseshit statements there in... Uh, in the State of the Union address that he was going to tackle climate change and, and if he couldn't get Congress to uh, help him, he would just do it himself, little dictator that he is. He'll just ignore Congress and do what he damn well feels like. A little dictator, uh, you know, as long as you're a dictator, you might as well be using your power to save the planet, you little dictator. Anyway. <clears throat> Let's see what this analysis says. President Barack Obama is talking about climate change like it was still 2009. The president, who rarely uttered the words climate change or global warming during his first term and during his re-election campaign, has now reinserted it boldly back into his lexicon. All right, you're know, talking about, uh, you know, for the sake of our children and our future, you know, we will respond to the threat of climate change. The difference between then and 2009 is that uh, Obama knows that Congress is unlikely to agree. Uh, that, that, you know, that, that, that he has a hell of a less chance now to get this this oil soaked uh, bought out Congress uh, by the oil industry to get on board with any of his already watered down joke attacks on climate change than he did four years ago that the that the US Congress is is less likely to respond to climate change than it was four years ago. And so he's gonna have to go it alone uh, if he actually, if he really were to make a commitment to battling climate change, which, which I know, and I assume you know, guys, is a bunch of horse shit anyway, that, uh, that he's gonna get no help from Congress and he's gonna have no choice but to act like a little dictator. And uh, so what is in his toolbox? In his toolbox are things as small as requiring appliances to be more efficient and as big as controlling the largest single source of heat trapping emissions of all the carbon pollution from this nation's coal-fired power plants. How boldly will he act in the face of inevitable pushback from industries and the cost of new regulations to the fragile economy. We've already talked about uh, one thing, you know, one tool in his toolbox, I think I've talked enough, about that, that he could kill the Keystone XL pipeline. There you go. He can kill it. Regardless he, he, of what this bipartisan letter of support from uh, Republicans and his fellow Democrats in Congress, or he can tell you, screw you. That's one thing he could do, uh, but he probably understands that it would do, ultimately would do nothing towards, towards uh, limiting global uh, climate change because the oil will just go to China. So guys, anyway, this is a long uh, a, a long, uh, in-depth article about, you know, looking at his analysis and it's worth your time to read about what his choices really are. Uh, you know, as I just said a minute ago, you know, his choice of, uh, uh, of championing a $10 a gallon gasoline tax, nowhere mentioned in this analysis of what Obama could do. You don't see any mention of a 10 cent hike in the, in the 
gasoline tax. Nowhere in the analysis. But anyway, I um, in the analysis, you know, they talk about uh, you know him getting tougher on big coal. And guys, this is my my personal guess that this is the most likely option that Barack Obama will take uh, for the simple reason that getting tougher on dirty big coal will get the least resistance from, from industry. And the reason for this is twofold. Number one, it is not like the coal is going to be left in the ground. These, these pushers of big coal, they have a, a, another client ready, willing, and able to buy the shit called China. You know? So China is just gonna, is gonna buy, we're just gonna ship more and more coal to China. It, it, it's not going to affect the bottom line of, of these mountain raping coal miners. One dollar! Or should I say one, whatever they call that thing over there, one in China, not, not one bit. They'll just, uh, they can keep that pipeline going to China and meanwhile ramp up the, predict, the production of natural gas through fracking, through gas fracking on our public lands, more and more on public lands. So they're just going to ship this coal to China to go over there so China can build its 455 coal burning power plants going online on this planet to spew all that shit in the air. And meanwhile, they can turn the power plants uh, in, in, in our own country over to natural gas and start burning up all the natural gas. They're just going to convert them to natural gas and they're going to have their, their planet and eat it too. So yes, this is what will be going on. So you will see Barack Obama as the big environmental savior by, it, 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 and I fully uh, cheer him on in attacking uh, big coal. More power to you, Obama, but anyone who believes that this is going to make one damn bit of difference to uh, climate change on this planet, yeah, right, guys. Anyway, so while all of this bickering, political bickering is going on, let me look at, you know, I always pick out six articles. Uh, and I don't know what my time is here. I try to make this 30 minutes. Uh, here's an interesting article uh, from Associated Press. <laughs> Associated Breath. Associated Press. <coughs> Climate contradiction. Less snow, more blizzards. And, uh, okay. From AP, with scant snowfall and barren ski slopes in parts of the Midwest and Northeast the past couple of years, some climate scientists have pointed to global warming as the culprit. Then, when a whopper of a blizzard smacked the Northeast with more than two feet of snow, some of the same climate scientists again blamed global warming. How can that be? It's been a joke among skeptics such as Alex Jones pointing to what seems to be a brazen contradiction. But the answer lies in atmospheric physics. A warmer atmosphere can hold and dump more moisture, snow experts say, and two soon-to-be-published studies demonstrate how there can be more giant blizzards yet less snow overall each year. Projections are that is likely to continue with man-made global warming. And so they break down all of these scientific studies that these climate deniers such as Alex Jones will never pay any attention to how 
you can have at the same time less snow and more blizzards and uh, but I'll just you know you can go on this page and read this for yourself okay here is Princeton University climate scientist Michael Oppenheimer quote shorter snow season meaning uh, that it's warmer in the fall and in, in warmer in the spring and winter is getting shorter and shorter so you have less days per year it's going to snow at all uh, that's one reason shorter snow season less snow overall but the occasional knockout punch that is the new world we live in. Okay, that's Michael Oppenheimer. Okay, here's Mark Sears, director of the National Snow and Ice Data Center. Quote, strong snowstorms thrive on the ragged edge of temperature. Warm enough for the air to hold lots of moisture meaning lots of precipitation, but just cold enough for it to fall as snow. Increasingly, it seems that we're on that ragged edge. Uh, here is uh, climatologist uh, Sarah Kapnick. Can we look, can we find a quote? Uh, we don't get a direct quote, but her study uses new computer models to, to simulate the climate in 60 to 100 years. She found large reductions in snowfall throughout much of the world, especially parts of Canada and the Andes Mountains. Uh, you know, talking about how all of the, this high mountain snow uh, is the the source of water, the source of drinking water for millions. If you throw in the Himalayas, probably billions of people on this planet are dependent on heavy snows in these high mountains, whether it be the Himalayas in Asia, the Andes in South America, the Rocky Mountains, right in the Sierra Mountains right here in the United States, how millions if not billions of people are directly dependent upon this snow melt in these high mountains for their drinking water, what that's gonna mean in this planet. And uh, finally, let me close with uh, this story, also from Associated Press. Islands want United Nations to see climate as security threat. And, uh, the, you know, this story is about how these various island nations are literally going underwater. You know, it's happening right now uh, in more and more islands. This is about the Marshall Islands. Okay, AP, the Marshall Islands and other low-lying island nations appealed to the UN Security Council to recognize climate change as an international security threat that jeopardizes their very survival. The low-lying islands, which are already being inundated with seawater, want the Security Council to bring its political weight to the issue and help their countries survive. You know, uh, good luck. Well, you know, what, what can the UN Security Council do about this, guys? Thinking the UN Security Council is going to make a difference in rising sea in rising sea levels. He said climate change has already taken a toll on his Marshall Islands. Wells have filled with salt water, making drinking water more scarce and in turn affecting food production. One small island is now underwater. Coastlines are being eroded. Blah, blah, blah. 
You can uh, read this for yourself. So while all of these 40,000 Americans are, are out there screaming about the, the pipeline, uh, these islands, uh, more and more of these low-lying islands are simply disappearing off the face of this planet. And uh, anyway, I think I've uh, come, done my duty for one more week's edition of my Climate Meltdown Roundup rant. And I'll be back on this rock next Wednesday with another load of it. So for now, let me say bye guys.